to uh, the example we had. No, I'm going to do it in this one. find the new document listener, so I have to import that. Um, Now as I type, it does the calculation for you, if that's the kind of effect that you wanted to. What's the difference in it? Uh, I know this was a question. This wasn't something I intended to go over, but I like to address questions, especially if they seem interesting. Uh, the difference is we have a different kind of listener, effectively. We have something that's called a document listener, which is kind of a weird name, because you don't think of that as being a document, but that's what it's called. 
So we have a different kind of listener that listens for different stuff, and we can call a function based on that. This is a syntax used for anonymous classes, which we're going to be doing in uh, our second example today. So if that throws you, um, uh, we'll be reviewing that in uh, the next example of uh, anonymous listeners. Um, and uh, so the short answer to how do you get it is a different kind of listener. It's not an action listener. It's a document listener. So instead of waiting for an action to happen on it, it waits for uh, something to be changed to the contents of it. And that would allow us to do that calculation that way. All right. So let's go back to the first example that we had, spend a minute reviewing that, and then we'll go back to uh, our next example where we'll look at anonymous listeners and other stuff. So the first example that we had looks like this. We have all these objects. This GUI is also the main uh, object, main class for this little application because it has the main method. So when we start off, we create an instance of it. We can call this main method without having an instance of that object because this is a static method. We set all the controls on the page. We set the visibility true. We set the close operation. We create a panel. We associate a listener, an action listener, with the button. We add the button along with the labels and text uh, box and another label for the results to a pane or a panel. And then we add that panel to our frame. So we set the size and side and we're ready to go. Uh, when we click the button, the action listener takes effect. We've defined this class as extending action, uh, I'm sorry, as implementing action listener, which means that this class itself has the code to handle when the button gets clicked. And in order to implement that interface, we need the action performed method to be called. And the action performed does the actual math in this example. It takes the uh, value from the text box, does a calculation of Fahrenheit to centigrade, or rather centigrade from Fahrenheit, and displays it. In the meantime, catching an exception, if any exception happens, which would most likely be that someone put in an invalid number, um, something that wasn't numeric. Do we have any questions on this one? It's the one we went over last time. Let's look at our second example. And our second example is notable for two things. We have two buttons. All right? We could assign both buttons the same listener if we wanted to. Then we would have to write code inside our listener to figure out which button got pressed. And I didn't want to do that in this example. So instead, in our second example, I created Excuse me. I created two action listeners, one for each button. I also have the layout, which we'll be looking at in a second. I'm playing around with the layout um, for this as well. So let's run this and let's look at the difference between the two, and then we will uh, go in and analyze the code in more detail. I'm going to delete the class files because I want you to notice something that's going to be a little bit different than any example we've gone over in class. There's only one Java file. And when I compile this, I'm going to get three class files. One of them has, and, and we can see 
they're, they're, they're named in a some, somewhat different manner than we've been used to seeing before. We have a class file for our first GUI class, which is in first GUI.java. But we also have first GUI dollar sign C to F dot class. And we have first GUI dollar sign one dot class. The fact that we have the name of the class with a dollar sign and then something else following it means that these classes were defined inside of the first GUI dot Java class. These are what are called inner classes because they're not a class, they're not a standalone class that stand, that, that's defined on its own, but it's a class that's inside of another class. So that's why the class file gets named that way. So even if I didn't, even if you didn't see the code, you'd know that inside first GUI there's two inner classes. Now notice one of the inner classes has what looks like a name, C to F. That's an inner class, all right? The one that has a dollar sign one, though, when we look at the code, there's no class called one. That's just a number that was generated. If we had two of these, it'd be one and two. This is what's known as an anonymous class. An anonymous class is a class that doesn't have any name, all right? We often do this for event listeners. We often create anonymous classes for event listeners because event listeners, listeners are very closely tied to the GUI, right? In other words, you have a window, a GUI, a frame with a panel in it that has text boxes and maybe a drop down and maybe a button and so on. And It's not like we're going to take the code that handles the button click and use it on some other page. We might use some of the code in another page. For example, a better implementation of this would be if I created a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion class. All right? So we might do that at some point to separate out that logic from the GUI, which is always a good idea. But for right now, the code that handles the clicking is written very specific to this GUI. So we don't really have any reason to think that we're going to be able to reuse it. So we don't bother making it a class that's reusable. We define it inside of the GUI class so it has access to all of the properties and methods inside the GUI class. And we don't really care about reusability for this class. All right? So let's look at the syntax on how we do that. I've done it two different ways in this example. Uh, I've done it with an anonymous class, and I've done it with an inner class that's not anonymous. You don't need to do it both ways. I'm just doing it both ways to show you how to do both. All right? So don't think that one has to be anonymous and one not anonymous. They could both be anonymous. They could both not be anonymous. If I look at the code for this, parts of it looks the same. Let's run it first. Notice now I have two buttons. I have a button that calculates centigrade to Fahrenheit and a button that calculates centigrade to Fahrenheit, or Fahrenheit to centigrade. So if I enter in an amount, if I click this button, one thing happens. If I click this button, a different thing happens. Now I could have one listener that was smart enough to detect which button got clicked, but I chose to, to make it a little bit simpler and have just a separate listener for, for each. So each of the listeners is pretty straightforward. So just like before, I have a label, a text box. I have two buttons here, and then I have a label for the results. My main method creates an instance of first GUI, and first GUI does essentially what it did before. Notice, however, I have two panels. 
I have panel P and P2. I add to P2 the two buttons. And I say the first button, centigrade to Fahrenheit, I add a listener of a new object of type C to F. And if I look, that class, C to F, is declared inside, completely inside the GUI's class boundaries. Now, because I'm plugging this in as an action listener, it has to implement the interface action listener, which is what I do. Public class C to F implements action listener. And what does it mean to implement an action listener? It means that you have to have the action performed event. Have to have the action performed event. And here it is. This grabs the value from the text box does the math to calculate the Fahrenheit, and displays the results, catches the exception. Now again, if this didn't implement the method action listener, I'd get a compile error. I have to compile it first, of course, but I would get a compile error. Because I can't plug in something as an action listener unless it implements that interface. Can't plug it in there. This method is expecting an object that implements the action listener interface. So when I got rid of that code from here, When I got rid of that code here that says it implements that interface, that caused the compile error. I must have closed it. Let me. Okay, now I should be able to compile it. And sure enough, I can. Now, because I said it implements action lister, it must have that action performed event. If I change the name of that function to something other than action performed, again, it's not going to compile. Because I promised that this implements the action listener interface. What that means is it has to have all the methods that are defined in that interface. There's one method defined in that interface, and that is action performed. And this class does not have the action perform method. So it won't let me put it in. It won't let me claim that it implements that interface when it doesn't have those functions. So now, this implements the interface. It has the action perform method. Because of that, I can plug it in to anywhere that an action listener is needed. So I'm simply saying, create a new instance of the C to F class, and that class will be, or that, that object will be the action listener for that particular button. And when the button is clicked, this is the code that gets done. So I should be all set. And I can compile it. I can run it. And I'm in good shape. So, 
In this case, my frame doesn't implement the action lister because it's not serving in that role. It's using another class to serve as the role of the action listener. Now, what about the other button? The other button has what's called an anonymous class. And this syntax gets a little tricky. And I advise you to be very careful in denning. I'm creating an action listener, OK? And that is going to be a new action listener. And I define everything about that new action listener right here. I put all the code for the class after the new action listener. In this case, this class doesn't have any name. Right? It's just the new action listener that we're creating for this button. So it doesn't even have a class name like this guy does. This has a class name of C to F. This is an anonymous class because I don't even give it a name. I just say, well, hey, I'm creating a new action listener, and here is all the code that exists for that new action listener. And again, in order to do that, in order for this to be a new action listener, it needs to have the action performed method in it, which I do. And then from there, I can go and write the code that handles what happens when that button gets clicked. I grab the value from the text box. I do the calculation. I display the results in the text box. or I display the exception in the text bar, in the label, that is. Now again, it has to be a new action listener. If I just say I want a new object here, it's going to give me an error. Because any old object can't serve the role of an action listener. So I have to make a new action listener. And when I make an action listener, it needs to have that action perform method. If it doesn't, then I can't call it a new action listener. It's telling me, hey, this anonymous class is, is not abstract, and it doesn't have the action perform method. So if I make it a new action listener, and I have the action perform method declared, then everything will be OK. I can use it as the action listener for that button, and everything's all right. People do this a lot. And I would advise you, again, to be very careful of the syntax. So I'm going to take a minute to review it, all right? Uh, because the syntax can be daunting at first. But if you break it down and look at it one step at a time, it makes perfect sense, all right? So button convert uh, FC, add action listener from here to here is the argument to that add, add action listener method. So that argument spans, what, 15, 16 lines of code? Goes from line 39 to line 45. Line 29 to line 45. Normally, we, or in other cases, we just say that. We say new C to F. But here, Inside of here is the definition of the object that we want to handle the action listener role for this particular text box. So we have new here. That's fine. We're creating a new object. What object are we creating? Well, if we had, a, an, if we had an inner class that had a name, we'd say new C to F where C to F is defined somewhere else. But in this case, 
We don't have that. We have, well, I'm going to create a new object of type without a name, but it's going to be implementing this action listener interface. So we have action listener, parentheses, that's calling the constructor of action listener. Then we essentially have the body of the class right here. Think of this from here to here as being the body of the class. And inside that body of that class, we have all the methods that we need for that class. In this case, because it's a new action listener, we need only one method. We need the action performed. So de de declared within this class definition is the action perform method. The code for that can look just like the code for any other listener that we would create. We do this again because this code is probably throwaway code. We don't really need it anywhere else. All right. No point in us actually doing uh, a good job creating some kind of nice reusable class and so on. This is simply a new action listener that's written specifically for this button on this page. One of the things that you learn in programming is, is there is typically a user interface. And then there's what is called business logic. Sort of between those layers is sort of glue that sort of holds those two together, that links up the user interface with the business logic. And that's the kind of code that we're going to have in the action listeners. Now, it could be a lot of code, typically. It's just going to be a few simple instructions. But its job is to connect that user interface to the business logic. You want to keep the user interface and the business object as separate as possible and as independent of, of each other as possible. And that way, you can change one without messing up the other one. You could have a calculation, for example, in your class that you can call from several different user interfaces. And if it's written in such a way that that is uh, able to, then all you have to do is change that sort of middle code that links the user interface to your business classes. Questions on this? Again, don't be confused by the fact that I did one one way and one the other way. I could have done both one way or both the other way. I could have created a separate lister called F to C that looked like this, but did the reverse calculation. Or I could have created another anonymous class here instead of that new F to C that looked just like this, except it did the opposite calculation. OK. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is the layout of this. And this is where we can do different things with the layout uh, to make it look a little bit neater. Again, you will be using, in many cases, a GUI that makes your job easier, where you can drag and drop and pop things on and, and all that. But here we're building it from scratch, and we're custom coding it. Here we're assigning a layout for our panel to be a box layout. And we're going to put the panel in it. And it's going to be going along the x-axis. What is the x-axis? The x-axis is vertically. So this is going to be vertically oriented. So the different boxes in our application are going to stack on top of each other. Right. Because in a 
Cartesian plane, you have x and y. where x is considered the horizontal axis and y is considered the vertical axis. So if I say it's go this goes along the y-axis, it means it's, it's stacked vertically. X-axis would be horizontal. Now what this means is everything we put in the panel is going to pile up like boxes on top of each other. So we put our first thing in the panel, our second thing in the panel, our third thing in the panel, our fourth thing in the panel. They're all going to pan, uh, they're all going to uh, stack up on top of each other vertically. Okay? Now, if you notice, if we look at this interface, oops, I want to run it. If we look at this interface, I want these buttons side by side. So how do I accomplish that? I accomplish that by making this second, or rather third thing, this third box on the list is also a panel. So we're going to have a panel inside a panel. This is our big panel, which I think is called P. This is our little panel, which is called P1. We're going to lay out things inside this panel P. We're first going to put the label that says enter temperature. We're then going to put the text box to enter the temperature. We're then going to put panel 1 in this spot. Panel 1, on the other hand, is going to have the two buttons in it. And it's going to be oriented horizontally. So panel 1 is going to have two buttons in it that are oriented horizontally. So when we pop that in our big panel, we get those two buttons oriented horizontally. And then finally, we have the label on the bottom. So. Notice what I do. I declare <clears throat> panel 2. I don't assign any layout for panel 2. So by default, it's going to be laid out horizontally. So panel 2 is going to be laid out horizontally. And I put in button to convert centigrade to Fahrenheit, and I put in button to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade. So panel 2 is going to contain these two buttons side by side. By default, the layout of a panel is going to be the box method, and it's going to be horizontal. So that's going to give us those two buttons side by side. Now I go in and I start adding things to panel 1, or just plain P. But in this case, whoops, I say that the layout for this panel called P is a box layout that is oriented along the y-axis, which means vertically. So I add the first label to it. That becomes the top thing. The text box is a box underneath the label. Panel 2, then, gets put beneath the text box. And what's in panel 2? Well, the two buttons are. So by adding panel 2, I'm adding both the buttons there. And I'm orienting them horizontally. And then finally, I have label results that appears underneath it. I set the content pane to P. I give a size for this, I set visible to true, and when we run it, this is what we get. This big thing in here is panel, uh, is a panel named P. Contains a label, text box, P2, which is a second panel. That panel contains two buttons and that are oriented horizontally, again, because that's by default. 
And then finally, I have a label underneath that. All right? Now, here's a, a question. What if I wanted it to look like this? And we can do this only using the box layout. What if I wanted enter temp and the text box to be side by side? I want the two buttons underneath them side by side. And then I want the answer to be like this. So I want the layout to look like that which is similar to how it looks before, except I want the label for enter temperature and the text box for enter temperature to be on the same line. How could I change the code to do that? What am I going to need an extra of? I'm going to need an additional panel. And I might as well call it P1. All right. What am I going to add to P1? Well, I'm going to add the label and the text box. So I'm going to add the label. I'm going to add the text box. Then finally, when I'm done, I'm not going to add the label and the text box individually. I'm just going to add P1, because P1 contains those other two things. The panels then are used to sort of group things together that you want to appear together. And so now my panel is going to contain panel 1 which is the label and text box, side by side. Panel two, which is going to be the two buttons side by side. And then finally, the label for the results. So let's save this and run it. And sure enough, there we are. We have that on all ours. What's, ha what's going on here? The label, or I'm sorry, not the label, but the text box is too small. So what do we do? How do we fix this? Well, let's see. Yeah, give it a size. I would think would fix it. And there we go. All right. So if you want something like this, where essentially you have things, you have a label and a field next to each other, side by side, you could put each of them in a horizontal panel and then put those panels in another panel that's oriented vertically. And you get all those pairs of labels and text boxes stacked up on top of each other. So if you had an inner temperature and then you had another label and text box or something, I can't think of anything you would see it as a box. Well, maybe you don't want a two temperature. Okay. You want two boxes underneath. Okay. Well, I'm going to try to try to duplicate what you said. Um, I'm going to put in a label that says enter something else. And I'll have a new text field for something else. 
All right. I will create three panels, mine as well. One, two, and three. Panel one, I'll add that. I'll add the buttons to panel three. And panel two, I'll add those new labels. And I'd add panel one, panel two, and panel three. The temperature, I know something else. C to F, F to C. I would think it, I would I would think it matters if it is uh, added to a panel and then to a I would think that, that the difference it makes is in that case it was direct in uh, the case where I had it before it was right inside the panel so it's probably going to take up the whole space of the panel okay. in this case it's only part of a panel so it's not going to take up the whole line okay. that's that's what I would imagine it to be okay so this is one way to do a layout. And you could probably do a lot of simple layouts with this, simply with a box layout. You can have uh, one, uh, one panel to hold, sort of contain everything, and then a series of horizontal panels that are going to hold the individual lines uh, of the other panel. And those you stack horizontally. The main panel you would stack vertically. You have another thing that you can do, which is, I'm going to copy this. I have some code commented out here. I'll keep the action listers done the same way. But I'm going to set the layout differently. And this is a border layout. All right. Let's look how it behaves, and then we will. Um, analyze it more detail. <laughs> 
I close out of the what do I do? See if I forgot to uncomment something out or something. Yeah, this should be E2. Okay, here we go. Still messed up because That was right, that should be that should be three. Okay, here we go. All right. This one uses a border layout. Now what the border layout means is the border layout divides the screen in two, one, three, four, five segments, I think. North, east, west, center, and south. And you can put things in them. All right. North, west, center, east, and south. All right. So if you look at this in this example, I put in the north the label for temp. So that's along the top. I put in the center the text uh, temperature for temp. Uh, the entry for it. That's over here. I put in the east P1 or uh, P3 which contains the two buttons and I put in the south the results. So that sort of breaks it down into a grid. Now here's where the fun starts. You can add panels, you can have these layouts nested. So you could have a box layout inside a border layout or vice versa to get the flexibility of exactly what you want. In this class, I'm not interested in creating dazzling, beautiful Java GUIs. I just want to make sure that you understand the basics of how these objects are created and how the layouts are used to put things, uh, arrange things in a, in a semi-logical way. Okay, that's all I had for today. Um, not sure what we'll talk about next time. I have to look at my notes to review. I think we continue on GUI, but we talk about connecting our GUI to other objects. Because again, we don't want functionality existing in our objects, uh, in our GUI objects, that, uh, that is. We want the functionality to live somewhere else.
questions. All right, we'll see you up in lab.